welcome to worship. Hello, everybody. I've just start waving to you guys now because I don't, I don't wave to you, and I think it's sad. And welcome to everyone on the live stream. Hello. It's lovely to have you with us today. Got a few notices this morning, so bear with me, and I will rattle through them. Uh, 21st of April, which is two weeks today, it's our next congregational meeting. So straight after church, so that's in two weeks. After church service, it's our congregational meeting. <clears throat> so if you can stay for that, great. Um, the fair trade stall is open today. Ooh. There's still bargains to help clear old stock. So feel free to go and have a look and uh, pick up your bargains. Plenty of Eastery bits, I think, and things like that. So do, do have a look. Um, you can also buy now and pay later. So Clue will chase you down eventually for money, but you, will, you can do that if you want. We also have um, on the 29th, is that a Sunday? 29th of May, there is a circuit service at Bilston with the Zimbabwean Fellowship. That's at 11 o'clock. If anybody wants to go to that, you are more than welcome to. But we are still keeping our church open. The rest of the circuit is closing, but because we're Methodist and URC, we're keeping our church open. So feel free to either go to Bilston with the Zimbabwean Fellowship or stay here. Those of you who are staying here, we're going to have a praise service. Yay! So we're going to have a praise service. So if anyone's got any hymn choices, for those of you who don't know what a praise service is, it's where we basically sing our little hearts out. And we all choose, well, people choose their favorite hymns from either the oldie worldy stuff or the really modern stuff or somewhere in between, whatever appeals to you. Choose your favorite hymn. If you can send it to me, if you haven't got my email address or you don't know how to contact me, then send it to the St. Andrew's email address and it will get to me or just come and talk to me, that's fine as well. If you're happy to say something about it as well and why it means something to you, all the better. And lastly, the 16th of June is a local arrangement. If anybody has a burning desire to do something for that local arrangement, because we've got some good talent in this church, we've got some talent that perhaps hasn't been tapped into yet as well, so if there's anyone who fancies doing a local arrangement, it can be a group of you, it can just be one person on their own, it can be cafe style, it can be like this, it can be watching something on the, we've got plenty of ability to watch stuff and talk about it, it could be anything you want to do. It doesn't have to be your normal traditional hymn sandwich, it can be anything. So if anybody has got a desire or a group of you have got a desire, please come and talk to me. It would be wonderful because I'm not around on the 16th, so I can't do it. So if anybody is able to, that would be wonderful. Okay, that's a lot of notices. A lot of things for you to digest. But let's take a moment to prepare for worship, and we welcome Trevor this morning. I'd encourage anybody who wants to take part in a local arrangement, actually, you know, bite the bullet because it's your chance to make worship as you want it not how you know people like me coming in uh, bring it to you so you know you don't have to do it all you can do little bits so I'd encourage you all to to get involved in that as many as you can so I'd like us to start this morning with our call to worship which is a a, a positive affirmation from Romans if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. So we're going to sing our first hymn now, which is number 309. And it says, see what a morning. I think some of us thought that as we stepped out the door this morning. But actually you'll see that that's not what it's talking about at all. So see what a morning.
Now I think our young people are going to leave us in a second, yeah? Are you here? Any young people here? I can't see you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah there are some people that are kidding themselves, they're young people. But uh, let's have a prayer. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the young people as they leave us now. May their hearts be filled with a love towards you. May they be inspired to know more of you. And may they each come to know you for themselves. Amen. And I look forward to seeing what you've been doing in, um, in, your, in your meeting uh, after the service. So somebody will show me, will you? Well, perhaps, perhaps. Let's join together in a time of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how good it is that we can come here this morning to, to sing your praise, to celebrate the risen Lord. For you, Lord, are almighty. You are great above everything else. Your power, Lord, is, is demonstrated through the defeat of sin through the defeat of Satan, through the victory of the cross. Lord, your power knows no ends. Your wonders are all around us for, for us to see each and every day. How wonderful, Lord, that we can share in this world that you have created for us. That we can be your people and that you can be our God. Lord, what a comfort that gives us, knowing that we can have that special relationship with you. But Lord, very often we spoil that relationship through our, our sinfulness, through our selfishness, through our, our arrogance, thinking that we are in control of this world, thinking that we know better than you. But Lord, you are the perfect example of an ever-loving Father. In that your love for us is always there. Your love for us is always demonstrated as you welcome us back to you. No matter how much we reject you, your love is there, growing stronger and stronger for us each day. As we welcome you and open our hearts to you. We know, Lord, that your love for us was so great that, that you wanted to take away the, this barrier of sin that separated us. And that you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, that he might come to this earth. That he might suffer and die upon the cross and be raised again. That each one of us may know that our sins are forgiven. That each one of us may be restored to you. And how wonderful, Lord, that you've also blessed us with your life-giving Holy Spirit. The sign that we are your people. That we are people of the risen Lord. The sign that we are your church, your body. But also the power that we might live our lives for you. That we might be your good disciples, your good ambassadors. That wherever we go, your name may be glorified. Amen. And now we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be.
As I've been here a few times now, obviously you're getting to know me a little bit and uh, know how difficult I find it to stick to the order of service. So I'm really thankful that you've printed it out in big letters so I can't miss it. So I do now know that we're going to sing our next hymn, which is number 293. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. <laughs> Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. The Gospels from John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fears of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand 
and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you for those readings. Uh, we're going to sing again now. When I, when I chose this next hymn, I always have to pass everything past the wife when I do my services because, uh, you know, she tells me whether I'm being daft or not, which I sometimes am. But she said, this is an Easter hymn. It's, it's, this is a um, harvest hymn. We always sing this at harvest. And I said, well, actually, it isn't. It's actually um, an Easter hymn because it tells us about, um, about Christ dying and rising again. And it tells us something about why Christ had to die. So it's, now the green blade rises, number 306. I think now after, after four years we're just about settling into to living at Codsall. But there are some really great things about living there. And there are some things I thought were really great at first which I'm now not so sure about. And one of those is that we've got a really good garden centre literally just round the corner. So that's great. Except my wife wants to spend all the time, let's just nip round the garden centre. And I think going to the garden centre um, any afternoon is probably, yeah, it's not one of my, my greatest things. But there's a really good advantage there, and that's that they've got a works actually in the garden centre. 
So while she's off standing hours looking at one individual plant, you know, I can go in there browsing around in works and actually seeing what I can find. Well, a little while ago I came across a book and uh, The Wicked Wit of Winston Churchill. And I thought, I need something a bit lighter to read it occasionally. And, um, yeah, it's quite different. I mean, um, I didn't realise that he was, um, yeah, when I say wit, I'm not sure about it, because some of it's really quite cutting and a bit far. Um, for example, uh, he was well known for his tipple before um, uh, Parliament, especially if it was a late sitting, and, uh, and especially for his dislike of the First Lady MP, Lady Astor. And in here it says one of them, it's, uh, he was told by Lady Astor, um, Mr Churchill, you are drunk. And his reply was, and you, madam, are ugly, but I shall be sober in the morning. <laughs> well, hey, you know. And of course, then there was another exchange where the lady asked where she said, um, um, Mr Churchill, if you were my husband, I would poison your tea. To which he replied, madam, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm not sure you'd get away with that today, would you? Could I get away with saying that in a sermon this morning? I don't know. But anyway, I was perhaps um, drawn to that book because my colleagues many years ago, um, they brought me a mug for Christmas. And um, yeah, it had got a couple of quotes of Winston Churchill on it. And I used to sit on my desk and I'd gained some uh, notoriety for my ability to, um, yeah, what should we say, unearth success out of something no matter how badly it had turned out. And uh, I was once told by my manager that uh, I could always be relied on to make a, a silk purse out of a pig's ear. Unfortunately, it was a skill that I had to use far too often. But, um, but the mug says, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. Uh, yeah, quite good, that, really. Well, I'm sure that the disciples who were locked in that upper room needed a bit more than, than a motivational quote because they had clearly suffered from a loss of enthusiasm and, and, and perhaps a great sense of failure. I mean, they'd locked themselves away, afraid of the, the Jewish and the, the Roman leaders. You know, they must have thought it had, it had all gone wrong, that it was all over. It would be hard to see for them how things could possibly get worse. Impossible to see how things could be turned around. They saw the death of Jesus as a, a failure of all that had happened in perhaps the, the last three years. But going back to the mug, as you turn it round, there's another famous Churchill quote. And he says, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. And he did on, on so many different levels, good and bad, I have to say, and personally and, and as an author. Well, as I was preparing for my service, uh, and, and I noticed that, that mug sitting on my, on my bookcase, and it made me think about Thomas. As you know, history has certainly not been very kind to him. He's gone down in history as, as doubting Thomas. Well, it is a title, isn't it? Very negative overtones. And I think if any of us wished to be remembered for anything, it wouldn't be for doubting. And it'd be pretty far down the list. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb because I'm going to say that I'm sure, in Thomas's case, history has been unkind to him. Because I think that he's been quite unjustly labelled as doubting. This is because his response to, to seeing Jesus in this gospel passage we've just heard. You know, it's actually the very um, climax of, um, of John's gospel. Because everything that we've heard before in John's gospel leads us to this one point. This great declaration. But we'll have more about that in a few moments. It had been a hard time for the disciples. They'd been on a roller coaster with Jesus for the last three years. Where was it leading? Where was it going? One thing that we can be sure of 
that the disciples certainly hadn't expected it to lead to the, the death of Jesus on the cross. Even though they'd been told that this was what was going to happen, they'd not understood or, or fully grasped what Jesus had told them. In fact, a, a few verses earlier, John spells it out in verse 9. He says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. You know, put yourself in their place. This must have been a, a really low point for them. Their world must have been turned just absolutely upside down. They must have felt like they'd, they'd taken a wrong turn. And then to confuse things even more, Mary and some of the disciples have said, well, they, they'd seen Jesus risen from the dead, that he was alive. So we find all of the disciples, all except Thomas, in the locked room, afraid, confused, meeting together for support and comfort. Then among them comes Jesus, showing them his hands and his side. Today we live in a world of, of doubt and disbelief and, and scepticism, don't we? And perhaps in some ways for good reason. There seems to be a deluge of, of scams and phishing and so on in emails and, uh, and social media, and even in person. I mean, just last night I had one that was supposed to be from DPD saying that, uh, you know, I've got a parcel waiting to be delivered. I've just got to enter my financial details in there to, uh, to get it, you know. They actually seem very credible. It looked just like a DPD email. So it's hard to know what to believe and what not to believe, isn't it? Well, you know, in some ways, people are people, whatever the time or place. And I'm sure it must have been much the same in, in Jesus' time. I mean, we've got these, uh, these disciples. They may have been simple fishermen, but you know, they were nobody's fools. They had to be streetwise just to survive in that time. So when the disciples approach Thomas with a story that really is just about as unlikely as you can possibly get, isn't it? You know, that this man who they'd seen dead on the cross was alive and walking around, you know, and they actually had no real evidence to, to support it. You can understand his reaction. But you know, I really think that we do Thomas a disservice when we talk about him as doubting Thomas. Because it's almost that as though he was different from the other disciples. Not as good, not as faithful. But you know, if you read that passage carefully, you will see that actually it wasn't any different for the other disciples who saw Jesus first. Because it wasn't until after Jesus had spoken to them and showed them his hands in his side, that we read that they were overjoyed to see the Lord. In Luke's account of the, of the same event, Jesus actually ate with his disciples, and this could be for, for no other reason than to convince them that he was real. He was with them physically, not just an image or an apparition, not just a figment of their imagination, but it was Jesus there, real, in person. You know, quite often, that word doubt is one that um, it's one of those words that must not be mentioned in, uh, in, a, in a Christian circles. But you know, that's wrong because doubt is actually a, a, a natural part of our faith. It isn't something to be hidden away or disowned. It's part of the process of finding and deepening our faith. You see, I think we often get into a problem because we confuse doubt and unbelief. We think of the same thing, don't mean the same thing, interchangeable. But in reality, this isn't the case at all. Because, you know, doubt and unbelief come from different ends of the Christian spectrum. Doubt? Well, that's where we're searching. We're wanting to find the truth. We're wanting to find confirmation. The presence of doubt actually indicates the presence of faith, because without faith, there couldn't be any doubt. But the other side of the coin is unbelief. 
Unbelief is different because instead of searching for the truth, unbelief dismisses the truth. Unbelief is where we've given up looking, given up searching, where our minds are, are closed. Now, some of you might, might know of Henry Drummond. He was, uh, I was going, a great preacher and uh, writer, I was going to say, over the last century, but actually, it's the one before now, isn't it? I can't believe how time's gone on. But he wrote this. Doubt is, I can't believe. Unbelief is, I won't believe. Doubt is honesty. Unbelief is obstinacy. Doubt is looking for light. Unbelief is content with darkness. Now many of the, the modern Christian paperbacks you read perhaps will leave you with the impression that, that any doubt at all is a, a sign of weakness. You're a second class uh, Christian if you've uh, got any doubt. But this actually ignores the fundamental truth that doubt is an integral part of our faith. If there was no doubt, and we had absolute, um, absolute proof, then it would be no longer be faith. One of my favourite verses in the whole Bible is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So doubt isn't something to be pushed away, something to be brushed under the carpet. Doubt is something we need to recognise, to own and, and face up to. Because a doubt that is hidden away will fester. And a doubt that is hidden away will grow into unbelief. But you know, a doubt that is brought out into the open, it can help us grow. It can help us understand the very basis of our faith. You know, it can help us to deepen our faith. I don't think God expects us to be doubt-free. But I know that he's calling us to be a people who will stop to listen. A people who will question. A people who will learn. And a people who, through that, will grow. Will grow to become more like him. And you know, this is certainly the position that Thomas was in. His doubt wasn't closed on belief, but an open, searching doubt. And when he finally met Jesus, his doubt was not just addressed, but it was absolutely smashed, it was demolished. So much so that Thomas could only respond, My Lord and my God. As I said right at the beginning, this response of Thomas to meeting Jesus is the very climax of John's Gospel. The story of Jesus' life is, is teaching the miracles, the parables, the death, his resurrection. They all lead to this one great statement, this proclamation of a truth beyond all others, that declaration of ultimate faith. My Lord, and my God. This is the very climax of John's Gospel because what Thomas pronounces here puts all that John had written previously into context. It expresses the purpose of, of John's writing, which he goes on to, to actually put a bit clearer later on. It shows us where the resurrection is pointing to. It tells us who Jesus is. And it tells us what he has done for us. You see, on its own, the resurrection was an event that was so powerful that it changed the whole of heaven and earth for all time. But unless it produces in us a response such as we've heard from Thomas, then we, we have wasted the power of the resurrection. Jesus didn't die and rise again just to defeat Satan. He didn't die and rise again just to defeat the power of sin. But he did it 
that we, each one of us, may find our way back to God. That we might travel that road that leads to our heavenly home. Jesus died on the cross and he rose again not just to change heaven and earth but that we might change that we might be changed that we might become a new person travelling on our Lord's path to our heavenly home and you know the first step on that path is to respond to Jesus in the way that Thomas did by saying my Lord my God. In Romans 10, Paul spells it out when he says, Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He says that. You will be saved. You know what's truly important in this story? It's not that Thomas doubted, but that Thomas was the first of the disciples, the first to acknowledge before any other disciples that Jesus is my Lord and my God. The cross today stands empty. And the risen Jesus is here now in our presence, standing before us. What are we to say? I pray, you know, that we will all find it in our hearts and our lips to cry out, my Lord and my God. Amen. <coughs> Our next hymn reflects that, that certainty and it's number um, 303 in the hymn books. I know that my Redeemer lives.
in our prayers of intercession this morning. There'll be times of silence. Ask you all just to, to listen to God speaking to you or to use your own prayers. After which I will say, the Lord hears our prayer. Would you please respond with, thanks be to God. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Let us pray for God's family throughout the world, for all who bear responsibility among his people, for all ministers of the word and sacraments, and for all who gather in his name here in St Andrews. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the peace of the world, for the rulers of all the nations, for government in accordance with God's holy will, and for a just and proper use of the natural resources of the world. Lord, every time we turn on our TVs, open our newspapers, or or look online, we see that there is trouble, there is war, there is famine. And we know, Lord, that there are 110 places in this world where there is armed conflict taking place at this very moment. And it breaks our hearts, Lord, to see the, the death and the suffering that's brought about. We pray, Lord, that those who seek to gain their own way through war, violence, through the intimidation of others, will see that nothing lasting can be gained by such means. And that the only true way forward is through peace, tolerance, understanding, and a love of one another. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the concerns and activities of this congregation and of this neighbourhood, and for ourselves, our families, friends and neighbours. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for all in sorrow, need, anxiety or sickness. For the neglected, 
the persecuted and the lonely, and for those in any need or trouble. And Lord, we bring to you those names that are on our hearts. And we pray that in their time of need, they will especially feel your presence, your strength, and your comfort. For most of all, that they may receive your healing hand of wholeness. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. Let us praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honoured. And pray that we also, inspired by their example, may have grace to glorify Christ. Lord, we pray that you will be with all of those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We pray, Lord, that their faith in knowing that you are there, that you are there to receive our loved ones, giving them life in all its fullness beyond the life we have today. The Lord hears our prayer. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will. And those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we bring these gifts to you, we remember that all we have has already been provided by you. We pray, Lord, that you will accept these gifts of money as tokens of our lives that we also offer to you. Take this money and take our lives and use them as you will, that your name may be glorified here in this community and throughout the whole of the earth. Our closing hymn this morning is uh, in, in the books number 313. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun. <laughs>
Let's bless each other as we say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Yes, yes, what have we been doing? Do you want to come up and see? Show everybody what we've been doing. Well, that's good. What's this, a sword? Yeah, yeah I like, oh, I like that. Oh, that's good. And what, what are the swords for? Sorry? The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Oh, that's good. Right. Who's, who's, oh, well, there you go. I was wondering whose sword I'd stolen then. Sword of the Spirit. So what else do we learn about the sword of the Spirit? Yeah, you know, right. Part of the armour of God. Right, that's excellent. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for showing me. And, and we've been doing boring things, we have. Thank you. Yeah, great. Oh, 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 I'm scared now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Yeah, have you had a good time, have you? Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Right. Okay, great. Thank you.